Welcome back everyone to 7.8 improper integrals. Here we're going to talk about the second type of improper integrals and this is the one that deals with discontinuities. So let's get to it. All right in this case we have f is continuous on the interval a to b including a but not b and discontinuous at b. So let me draw a picture here. Continuous over here and then at b something bad happens. So in this case let's make it a jump discontinuity something like this. Then the claim is we can still work with a definite integral uh, from a to b of f of x dx, uh, but we have to be a little bit careful. This is improper integral, so we have a limit as t approaches b now from the left. So that's that minus sign right there. It approaches b from the left of the integral uh, from a to t of f of x dx. If this limit exists as a finite number. Okay, if f is continuous, on a to b, now uh, it's discontinuous at a. Maybe this time we'll make it an infinite discontinuity, aka an asymptote. Then again, maybe we, this uh, integral can still be evaluated, the integral from a to b of f of x dx. This would be then equal to the limit as t approaches a from the right of the integral from t to b of f of x dx, if that limit exists and is finite. Okay, this improper integral is again called convergent if the limit exists, divergent if it does not. And we have a third case when we have a discontinuity in the middle of an integral. So A and B, it's all fine, but we have discontinuity at C in the middle. So let me draw a quick picture here. Again, let's make this one an infinite discontinuity, aka an asymptote. And then if this integral on the left and the right both converge, so the integral from A to C and the integral from C to B both converge, then we can define the integral from a to b of f of x dx as the integral from a to c of f of x dx plus the integral from c to b of f of x dx. Okay, so let's do a quick example then. So determine if the following interval converges or diverges. The claim is that uh, this function right here has a discontinuity, right? So let's draw a quick picture to see what 1 over the square root of x actually looks like. So 0 to 1, there's our interval. And at 0, there's a problem, right? I'd be dividing by 0. And this looks something like this. So let's try to figure out what this area would be, the area under the curve of this function from 0 to 1. So according to our definition, it's going to be the limit as t approaches 0 from the right of the integral from t to 1 of 1 over root x dx. Okay, well I know how to evaluate this integral. The integral, uh, I'm going to have 2 times root x, and then I need to evaluate from t to 1. Okay, so that's going to be the limit as t approaches 0 from the right of, and when I plug in 1, I'll get out 2 root 1, so that's 2, minus 2 root t. Okay, and now as t goes to 0 from the right, well, root 0 is just 0, so that's going to be 2. So therefore, this area right here, from 0 to 1, the claim is, that's area 2. So it converges, and the answer is 2. So it converges to 2. Okay. Uh, now the next thing we'll go on to do is the comparison test, but actually, let me back up here for a second. And why don't we evaluate out that problem at the very beginning, right? So the problem at the very beginning, yes, here we are. This is an improper integral of type 2, and it has a discontinuity at 0 in the middle of the interval, okay? So this is this, like, part C of this last theorem we were just dealing with. So the correct way to evaluate this out is to split it up as an integral from negative 1 to 0 of 1 over x squared dx, plus the uh, integral from 0 to 1 of 1 over x squared dx. Okay, and now these are improper integrals, right, because it's discontinuous at 0. So these are going to be limits. Uh, the first one, we should approach 0 from the left, right, negative 1 to 0. And then in the second one, we're going to approach 0 from the right. So we're just using the definitions here of our improper integral. Okay, well I can evaluate out the integral here. So when I integrate 1 over x squared, that's going to be negative 1 over x. I'll have to plug in negative 1 to t. 
and then in my second integral I'll have to plug in t to 1. Okay, and then we're of course taking limits of these things. So this is going to be the limit as t approaches 0 from the left of, and let's go ahead and plug in t, so this is going to be negative 1 over t minus negative 1 over negative 1. So negative 1 over negative 1, or they can do a little bit of cancellation if we'd like. Okay, plus the limit as t approaches 0 from the right of, and now I'm going to plug in 1, so this is going to be negative 1 over 1, minus, when I plug in, uh, t, negative 1 over t. So again, these negatives kind of cancel out a little bit. Okay, so now let's see, I have this negative 1 and this negative 1, so that's going to be a negative 2. And then the limit as t approaches 0 from the left of negative 1 over t, plus the limit as t approaches 0 from the right of 1 over t. And now let's think about this a little bit. So I know what this function negative uh, 1 over t and 1 over t looks like. And as I approach 0 from the left, the claim is this going to be heading towards uh, negative infinity. Well, really, minus negative infinity. So that's going to be positive infinity. And for the second limit, again, it's going to be heading towards positive infinity, right? Because 1 over a positive number uh, is going to be positive. So really, you can think of this as uh, like negative 2 plus infinity. Uh, and that's going to be heading towards infinity. Now, I don't like exactly writing this. Uh, arithmetic with infinity is still not well defined in this course. So let me just say that this is heading towards infinity, a.k.a. it diverges. So it, first of all, the answer is positive, which is way better than negative 2. But then actually, we figure out that it's not even finite. Because it goes infinitely up, in this case, uh, there is infinitely many infinitely much area there. So it diverges. Okay, so that's a good example of how we can use part C here. Let's get back and look at the comparison theorem. So the comparison theorem uh, deals with functions f and g. f is kind of the big function here. g is the medium function, and they're both greater than zero. So f and g are both positive. f is bigger than g. And this is for a period when x is greater than or equal to a. And the last condition is right. These should be uh, continuous functions. OK, so if we have all of that set up, the claim is that we can tell something about these improper integrals. So if we have an improper integral from a to infinity of f of x dx, and this converges, then the integral from a to infinity of g of x dx is convergent. Likewise, if the small one is divergent, then the big one is divergent. Let's draw out a picture, because uh, the picture makes a lot of sense. So here is my interval a. x should be bigger than or equal to a. Uh, this first function I'll draw out, this is going to be my f. This is supposed to be the big function. And then my smaller function g needs to be between f and the x-axis, aka 0. And remember, we're only really interested uh, a and bigger. So it could be negative, you know, to the left of a, that inequality may not necessarily hold to the left of a, but if it holds for when it's bigger than or equal to a, then we're well set up to use the comparison theorem. So the comparison theorem says that uh, if the big one converges, so let me go ahead and write here, I'll just point to the big one. So if the big one converges, so if this is convergent is another way to say that, then the small one converges. Remember, we're adding up areas, right? So it makes sense. It should converge, and it should probably be less than the big one. Uh, if the big one diverges, sorry, if the small one diverges, then the big one will diverge. So aka, if the small one has infinite area, then the bigger one will have infinite area. OK. So let's use the comparison theorem. The claim is, here in this example, we can't that this one will converge, but we can't actually determine what it converges to. So we'll use this comparison theorem. So the first thing that we should start off with is that we know something about sine squared of x. Sine squared of x, well, it's a positive number, right? Because it's squared. So therefore, sine squared of x is greater than or equal to 0. But then also, sine ranges between negative 1 and 1. So when I square that, it's going to range between 0 and 1. Right? Because you square a number that's less than or equal to 1, it's going to stay less than or equal to 1. 
Now let's go ahead and divide through by x squared. If you divide through by x squared, well, here is the inequality that you get. Notice that you're dividing by a positive, so it's not going to flip the inequalities. And so now our big function is 1 over x squared. Our smaller function, this thing that we don't know how to integrate, I mean, I could spend hours and hours trying to integrate this thing. It's very difficult. Don't bother. OK, so the uh, convergence, or the, sorry, the comparison theorem will tell us uh, that if f converges, then g converges. So why would this f converge, right? The integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x squared. Why would this converge? Ah, well, we had a theorem, right? Let's go back up here. Here it is. The integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over xp dx is convergent when p is greater than 1. So in this case, our p is 2, right? It's 1 over x squared. So therefore, since p is 2, we know that this thing converges. So I'll just quote the theorem, 7.8.4. p is equal to 2. So this thing converges. So therefore, by the comparison test, we know that the smaller function must also converge. So this is the integral of 1 to infinity of sine squared x over x squared dx. Again, I don't know what it converges to, but I know that it converges. All right, and that is the end of 7.8 improper integrals. It's homework time. I'll see you next time in 7.5.